I kept believing in it for three years. I had no money, I just believed in it. I dreamed about it, this place called Limbo. That was the beginning of it. The story of how 2D puzzle platformer Limbo was made begins with a young Arndt Jensen. Born in Denmark, Arndt spent most of his early years playing on his parents' small farm and exploring the neighboring woods. He often lingered by the stream in the forest, placing unusual bugs and leaves into the water, following them as they drifted away. Even as a child, he held a peculiar fascination for small animals and parasites, though he also despised them. The quiet wooded area gave him a unique sense of both freedom and fear, as well as a deep connection with life, but also death. People like the brothers Grimm, Astrid Lindgren, and Tove Janssen were responsible for a lot of my childhood memories. They dared to write about death in a much heavier way than people do today. After graduating from university with a design degree, Arndt won a competition held by Danish developer IO Interactive, best known for the Hitman series. Consequently, he joined the company. For a time, he enjoyed his role as a concept artist. He earned a good salary, and his colleagues valued both him and his work. However, as the job became more and more corporate, Arndt found it increasingly challenging to get his ideas approved. Dissatisfaction started to set in. As a result, he began channeling most of his genuine creativity into personal projects during his own time. In 2004, feeling particularly inspired, he picked up his pencil and began sketching. This drawing represents the starting point of Limbo's development. Arndt describes the image as a secret place that you might want to explore. Just from that first sketch alone, he knew it could only evolve into a game. Other mediums didn't even cross his mind. Ideally, he wanted it to be something more simple, something he could develop all by himself. Being a reserved and introspective person, Arndt was inclined to work solo initially. In the early stages of development, he contemplated creating a point-and-click adventure title. However, as he produced more concept art, the secret place began to take on a more sinister tone. Inspired by the Latin word limbus, meaning edge or boundary, Arn chose the title Limbo for the game, referencing the edge of hell, which is the game's setting. He also learned to program using Microsoft Visual Basic and managed to animate a sprite, in addition to visualizing a few other elements. However, he soon realized that bringing his vision to life would be a long endeavor, especially if he continued development on his own. By 2006, Arndt decided to seek help in building the game. To attract potential collaborators, he created a cinematic concept trailer, primarily intended to draw in freelance programmers. Unexpectedly, the trailer quickly went viral. Limbo, with its monochrome graphics and mysterious setting, offered something unique, something people hadn't experienced before. Soon, Arndt's inbox was flooded with partnership proposals, including offers from interested publishers. I got very scared by all these people contacting me. I had mail from publishers all around the world. It was a one-man project at the time, and it felt like they wanted to control it and be a part of it. I was so scared that people would take it away from me and make it more commercialized. Before we move on, I'd like to talk about this video sponsor, Star Trek Fleet Command. Star Trek Fleet Command is a free-to-play MMO game where you can immerse yourself in the world of Star Trek thanks to its open-world style of gameplay. It's made and still being supported by a passionate group of Star Trek fans that wanted to give players an authentic space exploration experience. We set out to make the best Star Trek game that's ever been made. Fleet Command puts you in the seat of a Starbase Commander, so it's your job to recruit legendary characters and build iconic ships from over 50 years of Star Trek history, including the Next Generation, the original series, the J.J. Abrams films, Discovery, and more. Send them out into the vastness of space and explore the galaxy freely, or use them to fight battles that test your strategic ability. Join a community of millions of Star Trek fans and work together for greater gain, and harvest resources to upgrade your ever-expanding fleet of starships. Choose a faction and gain a tactical advantage over your enemies. You can try out and install the game for free by simply scanning the QR code on the screen, or by clicking on my personalized link in the description. New players can also use a special promo code to receive a free content pack that will help you towards unlocking Captain James T. Kirk. The game is available on both desktop and mobile. If you create a Scopely account, you can even seamlessly transfer your progress when you play at home or on the go. Every month, Month, new events, in-game contests, giveaways, and more are added to the game, so there's always something new to discover and enjoy. Star Trek Fleet Command, the final frontier is yours. Now back to the video. 
One of the partnership requests in Arn's inbox was sent by Dino Patti. As fate would have it, Dino was in a similar state of mind as Arndt at the time. He had worked as a programmer for an advertising company before transitioning to a role in the gaming industry. However, reality did not meet his expectations. Issues like poor management, economic constraints, challenges in finding the right talent, and difficulties in getting ideas approved rapidly diminished his initial enthusiasm. And that's not even mentioning the intense crunch periods Dino faced. He eventually accepted that he might never get to work on his dream game, and resigned from his game development job in 2006. But then he came across Limbo's concept trailer, reigniting his passion and determination to pursue his dream job again. He sent an email to Arndt, proposing they meet to discuss the project. During their first conversation at Arndt's apartment in Copenhagen, it became immediately apparent how different they were, yet also how complementary their skills and personalities could be. Dino describes Arn as someone who thinks more than most, while he himself has an easier time just getting stuff done. In other words, while Arn is able to make better and more creative decisions, Dino tends to be more productive. Moreover, Dino's confidence and natural charm were precisely what the project needed to elevate it to the next stage. Their initial plan was to have just the two of them complete and release Limbo as a free PC title. However, after several months of work, they recognized that, despite their combined efforts, completing the game would be almost impossible, as its scope and vision kept expanding. So, instead of Dino handling all the programming and Arn taking care of every design aspect, they started hiring additional staff. They brought in more coders, increased middle management, and hired designers, allowing the pair to be at the center of everything. Naturally, hiring more people required additional funds, far more than they could personally afford. Fortunately, Arndt and Dino succeeded in obtaining grants from the Danish government to support Limbo's development. Remarkably, this was the very first time Denmark had approved grants for the development of a video game. These grants, combined with Dino's and Arndt's own money, were enough to expand their team and accelerate development. With Dino's innate business instincts propelling them forward, things were moving ahead fast. By the end of 2007, Six, Playdat was officially established, and on January 1st, 2007, the developers settled into their first office, a modest 11 square meter space that, according to Dino, smelled pretty rotten. The rising development costs meant that Limbo could no longer be a free PC title. It needed to transition to a commercial release and be made available across multiple platforms. Now, with a redefined vision and a new office space, the team was all set to further develop the gameplay and iron out technical details. One significant decision was choosing a game engine. Arndt had been on the hunt for the perfect engine for some time. Together, he and Dino tested every available engine, but none met their criteria. The engine for Limbo had to be both empowering for its creative team and allow for rapid iteration. Luckily for Playdead, Jeppe Carlsen applied for a programming position at the studio. With a background in computer science and a profound passion for video games, Jeppe had previously worked as a game programmer at a small company. Upon joining Playdead, he dove straight into building Limbo's engine from scratch using Visual Studio. It wasn't long before Arndt and Dino recognized Jeppe's creative talent, which led to his promotion as a primary gameplay designer. In this role, Jeppe was tasked with honing the game's core design principles, and crafting its distinct challenges and puzzles. From early on, Arndt had a clear vision of the player's journey. He had mentally storyboarded the game's pivotal moments, starting in a forest, transitioning to a factory, navigating rotating gears, the spider encounters, and even the unique glowing brainworm concept that makes up one of the game's core puzzle sections. However, bringing these ideas to fruition required more than just imagination. Arndt and Jeppe had to work together to transform these visions into tangible gameplay experiences. It wasn't enough for Playdead to rely solely on traps and jumps. They wanted each puzzle to be based on a unique concept. Therefore, if two puzzles appeared very different from first glance, but shared the same underlying solution strategy, the developers would pick the better one and scrap the other. This way of working led to 70% of the game's content being stripped out, vastly reducing its overall runtime. It was really important to keep it fresh throughout the game. I always said it has to be unpredictable. You must never know what happens in the next 20 seconds. It's more important to have the impact and people playing it through to the end instead of just a lot of content. 
Most of the puzzles were developed in an isolated environment, devoid of any narrative context or polished graphics. In fact, for a long time, the protagonist was merely a blocky figure within an abstract space, allowing the developers to quickly iterate and test ideas. The devs were aware that they couldn't rely solely on graphics and sound to make the game compelling. The gameplay had to be robust and engaging from the outset. Everything else would simply enhance the experience later on. When Arndt and Dino saw how engaged playtest were during the spider chase sequence, even when it was just a blocky character pursued by a red rectangle, they were confident they were on the right path. Fun fact, the spider's inclusion was born from Arndt's own arachnophobia. Limbo underwent numerous iterations because Arndt was adamant about taking the time to experiment with various concepts, such as multiplayer, co-op and other prevalent video game elements. He believed that only through hands-on experimentation could they accurately determine which ideas were not a good fit for Limbo. Ultimately, the team decided on a linear single-player puzzle platformer. One of the most challenging aspects during development was communicating to players that their current approach to a puzzle was incorrect without causing frustration. To mitigate frustration, the team minimized the use of physics-based puzzles. As Yeppe explained in an interview with IGN, incorporating physics is challenging because interacting with realistically behaving objects will always produce different results. Consequently, a player might need a hundred attempts to achieve the precise outcome required to solve a puzzle. While numerous physics-based objects are found in the game, they typically don't play an important part during puzzles. Maintaining simplicity in both the puzzles and the overall game was a foundational design philosophy. When Yeppe begins crafting a new puzzle, he initially views the player as his worst enemy. This perspective helps him develop the most insidious puzzles possible. However, he then switches his viewpoint, seeing the player as an ally, guiding them by providing the right clues. The idea is to conceive the most intricate puzzle possible and then scale back. This approach led to a lot of early puzzles that were far too complex, which then had to be stripped down to their core elements. It's why every final puzzle usually only utilizes one or two different mechanics, ensuring that all of them remain both simple and profound. After all, once the player thinks of the right solution, it should be fairly easy to execute. Arndt especially harbors a deep frustration for games that appear complex on the surface, boasting lots of mechanics and elements. Yet, upon closer examination, they prove to be remarkably shallow. This sentiment is a primary reason he put his foot down about not incorporating any type of inventory system. We talked about it in the beginning, and I insisted on having very few elements and no inventory. Dino was like, what? It's an adventure game, there should be an inventory. We can't do deep gameplay without this inventory. Another way the studio alleviated player frustration was through extensive playtesting. Their preferred method of conducting playtests is known as tissue testing. This involves bringing in someone who's never seen or heard about the game and observing them as they play. It's crucial to provide minimal guidance during the session, allowing them to figure everything out for themselves. Typically, once the session concludes, these participants don't return to play the game, as they can only experience it for the first time once. This method enabled the team to design puzzles where failure and success are obvious once the player sees it. In total, Playdat had about 150 tissue testers play the game. Tissue testers help Playdat realize that if players repeatedly failed while attempting the correct solution, they would eventually abandon that approach and try something else. Once that happens, it becomes exceedingly difficult to redirect them to the correct solution. Therefore, Yeppe ensured that incorrect solutions were clearly recognized as such. He also designed puzzles in specific ways to prevent players from coming close to solving them through incorrect methods. Otherwise, players could get very attached to keep trying that approach. Considering Limbo lacks any hint system and in-game menus, it was a big challenge for Playdead to construct the perfect puzzle over and over again. Failing to solve a puzzle, or simply not knowing what's about to come next, will often result in death. As Yeppe puts it, the gameplay is all about learning by dying. Recognizing that puzzles like replay value, Yeppe deliberately crafted levels to mislead players, making dying nearly inevitable. The hope was that players would learn from their mistakes, adjust their strategy, and enjoy overcoming the many puzzles. While the team explored ways to make death more entertaining, giving its prominence in the gameplay, early versions saw the 
boy explode when killed. However, this made it difficult for players to connect and identify with the boy. Consequently, it became very important to Arn to make the boy feel lifelike and grounded in reality by having his physics accurately respond to his surroundings. This in turn gave rise to the very gruesome but entertaining death scenes in the final game. All of the boy's behaviors and procedural animations were crafted by programmer Thomas Krog, who dedicated three years to perfecting the way the character looks, plays and reacts to the environment. Even though a significant portion of time and budget was allocated to creating realistic physics and lifelike animations, Playdead wasn't striving for realism or high polygon counts. Instead, Dino and Arn prioritized allocating the most resources to the game's essential elements. In Limbo's case, the focus was squarely on gameplay and making making it feel like a complete package. Fans may have noticed that the first half of the game features more scripted moments and storytelling, while the latter half has a bigger focus on puzzle solving with fewer distractions. This was not a coincidence. Arndt, who was heavily involved in the early stages of development, was very vocal about evoking emotions and telling smaller stories. However, as gameplay designer Yeppe began crafting more of the hardcore puzzles, that vision of telling small stories started to shift somewhat. When asked about it during an interview with IGN, Arndt said it's a big wound and wishes he would have kept more oversight during the entire development process. What Arn started doing instead during the midpoint of development was integrating each isolated puzzle into the game and making sure they felt like an organic part of each area. In other words, craft one cohesive experience. The team aimed to prevent players from feeling they were merely transitioning from one puzzle to the next, even if, at times, that's precisely what's happening. Throughout this process, Playdead embraced a minimalist and ambiguous approach, which Arn calls quiet immersion. I really enjoy getting rid of everything to see what works. It should be working when it's very naked and there's nothing, no music or anything. I really enjoy the moment where you can be sucked into this world with just a small sound or a hidden detail in the corner. It's for the same reason why the team stuck to the black and white aesthetic and why the game features a more subtle soundtrack. Martin St. Anderson, a classically trained musician who had no prior experience in game development, joined Playdead as a full-time audio designer. He came on board midway through Limbo's development after the initial composer struggled to capture the desired sound. A graduate of the Royal Academy of Music in Aarhus, Denmark, Martin specializes in electroacoustic music. This abstract form of music is usually created to be played through speakers, rather than to be performed by a live orchestra. It normally exists solely as fixed media audio recordings that can be traced back to an actual sound source. The studio believed Martin's unique expertise would align perfectly with Limbo's otherworldly ambience. Martin tried to find ways to always make the sound come from the environment itself and, whenever possible, sew those sound fragments together so something musical would come into existence. Mirroring the game's visuals, the music was crafted to be ambiguous, aiming for each player to derive their own interpretation. To achieve this, Martin incorporated various sound textures and experimented with assigning subtle noises to the other characters in the game. However, he deliberately stayed away from adding screams or voices. For example, the spider chase originally featured more music and sounds, but the scene became significantly more dramatic when Martin stripped it of all but the most muted sounds, creating what he describes as a muffled sound world. In certain areas, Martin made things less subtle and added actual background music, but always with a unique touch. For instance, just before the hotel sign section, where electricity is a crucial element, ambient music starts playing. Interestingly, Martin has mentioned that this is intended to mimic electricity distortion and the harmonics stemming from it. He enjoys sneaking in these types of sounds subtly, ensuring players don't think, oh, there's music now. Everything melts seamlessly with the environment and gameplay. All of that said, many players may not even notice the game's music, but that was kind of the whole point according to Martin. The developers wanted to craft an ambiguous atmosphere and not tell players how to feel or when to be scared. If you do tell the player how to feel, it could have the opposite effect. By refraining from constantly holding the player's hand, Playdead aspired to offer a more unpredictable and genuinely terrifying experience. By 2009, the team relocated to a new office in the heart of Copenhagen, allowing Art and Dino to better accommodate their expanding team, which had grown to 8 core members. Although Playdead secured a few investors by offering them shares in the studio, a decision that caused problems later on, Arndt and Dino had invested nearly all of their own money and time into the project. It was a big risk on their part. Limbo almost had to become a commercial success at this point. To maximize its exposure, the studio began 
began looking for a publisher. Throughout this search, their top priority was ensuring that Playdead retained the IP rights and maintained full creative control. Arndt and Dino agreed to never compromise the product for money. They knew that the value of a small company like theirs lies in its creative people and what they produce. That, above all, needed to be protected. On top of that, they believed that larger budgets could stifle innovation since you need to please a lot of people. One of the parties interested in Limbo was Sony, which even wanted to make the game a PlayStation exclusive. At a conference in 2012, Pete Smith, a former Sony Computer Entertainment executive producer, said the following. I maybe shouldn't say this, but we had issues when we were trying to sign Limbo because of the IP. There are obvious benefits to keeping it, but also to giving it up. You're way more likely to get the deal. Remember, 100% of nothing is nothing. A publisher is much more likely to commit to marketing and merchandising if they own the IP. Sometimes all we want is protection, so developers don't make a game, finish it, then go to one of our rivals. We look at IP on a case-by-case -case basis. With a bit of common sense, you can find common ground. Round. Though the deal with Sony might have been tempting, Dino and Arndt were not prepared to give up their IP. Ultimately, it was Microsoft, Sony's direct gaming rival, that made Playdead an offer they couldn't refuse. Microsoft would put the game front and center on their Xbox Live Arcade service for millions to see and play, cover all previous and future development expenses, and provide support in every possible way until the game's launch. Furthermore, Playdead would retain the rights to Limbo and maintain complete creative control. The single stipulation was that Limbo would have to be an Xbox 360 exclusive. While Arndt and Dino initially wanted Limbo to be a multi-platform title, they accepted Microsoft's proposal. However, having full creative control didn't prevent Microsoft and other investors from offering their suggestions. For example, the funniest suggestion Arndt can remember is when Microsoft expressed concern over the boy's death in the game. An investor suggested making the boy appear older by giving him a mustache. We had most of the investor cliches you can think of. They had huge inferiority complexes and they tried to control the company with no usable knowledge or respect for us. When it came to marketing the game, the two founders felt that the more Limbo seemed to evolve into something significant, the less inclined they were to heavily promote it. So, Dino and Arndt limited their marketing efforts to some PR and talked with journalists. Beyond that, there were no large-scale marketing campaigns, billboards or TV advertisements. They did release a trailer shortly before the game's launch, but that was the extent of it. Naturally, their investors struggled to understand the decision to refrain from advertising Limbo more prominently and thought Dino and Arndt were crazy. As Dino put it, most investors have no trust with what consumers want, but they know advertising is expensive and expensive things work. During the peak of development, Playdead had a team of 16 people, and near the end, they scaled back down to its 8 core developers. As previously mentioned, the studio took their time with the game as new ideas kept forming. According to Arndt, it seemed almost never-ending. Even two months before release, they were introducing new content and making significant changes to certain sections because they came up with better ideas. At the same time though, they were running out of money, Microsoft was pushing them to release it, and the developers were starting to get too stressed out. It reached a point where it felt necessary to make crucial decisions, finalize the game and set aside any remaining ideas. What began as a solo effort from 2004 until 2006 that saw Arn tinkering away on his own trying his best to bring his vision to life turned into a collective endeavor that managed to finish Limbo through sheer dedication and teamwork. Finally, the game was set to be released on July 21st, 2010 for Xbox 360. However, months before this, the Entertainment Software Rating Board had listings that indicated the PS3 and Steam version of Limbo were on their way. Playdead quickly clarified that this this was a mistake, however, and that the game would remain quote-unquote an exclusive for life on Xbox 360. Upon release, Limbo received widespread acclaim from both gamers and critics alike, with many deeming it a masterpiece or instant classic. Damon Hatfield from IGN commented in his review, Very few games are as original, atmospheric and consistently brilliant as Limbo. Not everyone agreed that Limbo was a great game though. When the developers came across the first negative review, published by the Boston Phoenix, they couldn't help smiling. 
There must have been some kind of mix up with what I downloaded. The limo that I played was a worse sort of art for art's sake garbage. It valued from over substance, mistook vagueness for meaning and confused capriciousness with cleverness. This game is a charade. Dino said he and the team enjoyed reading it in the office and recognized that the critics somehow hated all the things that they intended the game to be about. By all accounts, Limbo was a massive commercial success. In less than a month, over 300,000 copies were sold. And by August 2010, its lifetime player count approached that of Braid, which had been released two years earlier. Given that Limbo was a single player experience with little to no replay value and no DLC in the works, analysts predicted a significant drop in sales. However, they were proven wrong when Limbo sold 527,000 copies in 2010, making it the third highest selling Xbox Live Arcade title that year. Phil Spencer, the vice president of Microsoft Game Studios at the time, noted that Limbo caused a shift in the gaming industry. He mentioned that there was a time when Live Arcade focused on well-known IP. However, thanks to indie games like Braid and Limbo, it's becoming more diverse. He also expressed his admiration for Limbo, even considering it his game of the year. When award season came around that year, Limbo stood out amidst the big AAA titles. It garnered dozens of nominations, including for Game of the Year awards. It even competed for Best Game at the BAFTA Awards alongside heavyweights like Mass Effect 2, Super Mario Galaxy 2, and Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. At that time, it was rare for indie games to receive Game of the Year nominations. However, Limbo demonstrated to the industry that even a small independent team could produce a game worthy of such a claim. Although it didn't win the Best Game BAFTA Award, it did secure numerous others, including Best Indie Game, Adventure Game of the Year, and Best Visual Art, to name a few. When award season was over, Limbo managed to take home over a hundred awards. Limbo's success persisted into 2011, partially thanks to something that played at set would never happen. A PS3 and Steam port were revealed in June 2011, and played at announced they were developing them in-house. As it turned out, the Xbox exclusivity deal lasted only a year. By the end of 2011, Limbo had sold over 1 million copies across Xbox, PlayStation, and Steam. Although no external parties ever owned the Limbo IP, the fact that entities with a stake in the company could potentially influence future decisions was a concern for Arndt and Dino. Fortunately, thanks to Limbo's overwhelming financial success, the two studio founders managed to buy back their shares from all of their quote-unquote bad investors, regaining full control over Playdat. Since then, Limbo has been launched on nearly every conceivable platform and has sold over 8 million copies. Playdead went on to develop and release the critically acclaimed game Inside in June 2016. However, only a few weeks later, Dino announced his departure from the company to seek out new challenges. By January 2017, there were reports suggesting the split was not amicable. A Danish newspaper claimed that disagreements over IP ownership and release date schedules were the cause. Dino later clarified to GameIndustry.biz that such reports were based on mere speculation. While he wanted to keep the details about the rift private, he did say that a conflict between the two led to Arn submitting a resignation letter. Subsequently, Dino removed his longtime friend from the studio CVR register, a record of a company's personal and financial information. Once someone is removed from this register, they are effectively cut off from the company. Arndt was taken by surprise and deployed his legal team, clarifying that his intention was only to step down as creative director, not to leave the company entirely. He still wanted to remain in an executive role. Dino, however, contended that the letter didn't clearly convey this, leading him to believe that Arndt genuinely wanted to exit the company. Unable to reach a mutual agreement, the Danish business authority intervened. The outcome was that Dino was forced to resign from the company and to sell his 49% stake in Playdat for a total total of $7.2 million. Meanwhile, Arndt was able to remain at the company. Despite everything, Dino expressed his sadness over leaving the indie studio. He told Kotaku that Arndt had been not just a valued business partner, but also a close friend for many years. He still considers Arndt as one of the best game directors in the world. Later in 2017, Dino co-founded his own studio named Jumpship, which went on to develop and release Somerville in November 2022. Played as lead gameplay designer, Yeppe also departed the company to establish Geometric Interactive. This new studio released the video game Cocoon in September 2023. Notably, when Yeppe exited Playdead, several other programmers from the studio joined him. 
as of this video's release, Playdead is diligently working on their next game. All we know so far is that the game will be a third-person science fiction adventure set in the remote corner of the universe. Additionally, based on open applications regarding the project, it'll be Playdead's first open-world game. According to the official website, the team now counts over 70 developers. Whether that means the game will be bigger in scope and length remains to be seen. Given the departure of several key figures, it'll be interesting to see how this studio's third game fares and whether the studio's unique atmosphere and essence remains intact. Before I end the video, I quickly want to announce I launched a website for the channel. I partner with .fun to establish my website at thatguyglen.fun. From now on, the references for each video will be available over there, instead of the YouTube video description box. Game developers will also be able to apply for a partnership request, so we can work out a way to spread the word about your upcoming indie game. It's all still in the early stages, so expect some changes to the website in the future. Also, if you'd like to get 90% off your own .fun domain for a whole year, Year, you can use my promo code the guy Glenn at get.fun. Alright, cheers everyone.